Um, I've changed the title just a little bit. Substantive Landscape versus the Emblematic Scapes of Modernity, Archipelagic Sea and Land Commons contra Property and Territory. And if you can see the pictures, I have uh, the, uh, uh, the sea that we're in right now with Thilos, is that how you say it? Thilos in the center and Teresa out towards the margin. So that you see on the other side, an uh, illustration from Alice in Wonderland actually showing how we visualize landscape today using uh, Euclidean geometry. As you might know, the author of Alice in Wonderland was a geometer. Uh, now, uh, Samuel Johnson in 1755 produced the first decent uh, English dictionary. And he uh, was actually interested in landscape and choreography and these such, such. So he actually knew what he was writing about. And uh, the non-modernist, not, uh, that is prior to modernism, which I think is an ideology, uh, meaning of it was a region, the prospect of a country. Now, you've all been talking about land as if it was the, what we're walking on. But it's, and originally, it was an area, a region. Or a prospect, which is like a, a, a visual description of that area, of its prospects. Uh, and I said it was a substantive, smooth, topographical, terrestrial, commonplace formed from the inside. And I believe that this meaning of landscape was very close to the Greek concept of Kora. I'm not alone in this. Uh, and I should, uh, and then uh, the modern mean, or the modernist meaning that he gives is a picture representing an extent of space with the various objects in it. So it's the space then within which, and he's talking about Euclidean space, so it's an abstract space within which things are placed. Which, so on the one hand, you're talking about shapes that people are relating to, and the other hand, you're talking about an abstract space within which things are located. Um, so this is what gives rise to the modernist scenic meaning, that is kind of scenery, uh, which is usually, which in linear perspective normally is per, uh, de described as a, a Euclidean flat striated emblematic space of external power. So that property or the territory of the state is something is defined on a map of this kind, which would have been a, uh, most famously a Ptolemaic map. And Ptolemy was uh, Greek Roman. And he was actually, I think, more Roman than Greek in his mapping. Now, if you go back to the old Nordic definition of landscape, which is the foundation for the use of the term in all the Germanic languages, which is includes English, for example, uh, it was landscaper, conditions in a land. So they use, he's using word, we're using word land in this sense like we would use it in Scotland, the land of the Scots, or Ireland, the land of the Irish. Uh, it's not soil. And uh, it's, it's conditions in a land, it's traditions or customs. And custom also relates to the notion of mores or morals. So it's a, mo a moral value as well as a legal value. Because customs are a form of law. Customary law is legal. You have in, in a, especially in the uh, British uh, American countries, the custom is the foundation of law. And, and uh, this is important, I think, because people confuse custom with tradition. Tradition is a kind of modernist way of thinking. Traditions are sort of frozen and, and uh, don't change, and it was invented by the modernists who, didn't, who wanted to change things. Uh, custom keeps changing. So like uh, near our country home, which I'll show you hopefully at the end, there is a, a beach where uh, in the old days people had a customary right to go fishing and hunting. Poor people could go hunting there. But uh, today uh, you have a right to go there and get a suntan or a sunburn or whatever you do. So, so the custom changes over time. This customary right goes back at least to 1242 when it was first written down. But actually it's much older than that. Uh, and then the second, the way this term evolves is it's the organization of things in a land. And the organ things were organized in the land by the meeting of the thing. The th that is the original meaning of the word thing, is this institution called the thing. And the thing was a, a representative body elected by the people, or, or maybe all the people on certain cases. And this thing, the people there were people who knew their things, 
and they would decide on how things were to be done. And by doing that, they would shape the landscape. So the word scape means both shape, as has been said, but it also means still today in Scandinavia to create. So you create the landscape on the basis of custom. And knowing your things, I think, is what we've been talking about already, that, that, that the hand craftsmen and so on, they know their things. And uh, the final is the landscape, is the district, the area or the region, as it's called. And, and so uh, the word landscape meant both the, a, a certain kind of region or it could also mean the people of that region. And finally, it could mean the physical land of that region as shape. And in a way, it's less confusing if you use the, uh, not the Germanic, but the, um, the Latin-derived meaning, the romance, as they say, is, is to say it's, um, uh, it's pai, uh, the paysage, which is the character of the pai, which is the kind of region or so on. So even in the, these languages, it's very parallel meaning originally. Now, I, I, I'm going to try to not talk too long, but I'm going to depart from my text to give you an example of this because of the way we've been talking today. Uh, the Wadden Sea extends basically from the Netherlands up to Denmark and uh, uh, on the Atlantic side, of course. And, and it's very, very shallow. And uh, the, uh, the, major the major ethnic group in the Wadden Sea is, uh, is the Frisians, the Frisian people. And uh, the Frisians uh, have had territories on or had areas on the, on the land side, but they were most, mostly islands. So it was a kind of archipelago or archipelago as we have here. And uh, uh, one, of the one of the ones that I've looked at is, uh, is called Eiderstedt, which is the place on the Eider River. And uh, Ferdinand Tunis, who came up with the concept of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, or community and society, and basically our whole discourse about community comes from him. He comes from Eiderstedt. And uh, the thing about Eiderstedt is that it's, it's actually originally was three different landscapes. They're called landscapes legally. They were legally defined as landscapes because they made their own constitution. There was a kind of democratic thing. And the, uh, th the way they uh, created, the way they, they made their land, shaped their land, was as uh, Tim Mingle, who I'm sure would be happy to know, weaving it. They wove the land. And the way they did that was that they wove mats at a, uh, uh, and then they would stick them up, uh, standing up, uh, uh, basically at the water line. But that keeps changing in a flat area like this. We have a very big changing tide. And then in the winter, the water is very high, and the sediments get brought up. And then as the spring and summer comes, they get lower, and they catch the sediments. So the land gets a little higher. Then they plant grass on it. Grass it catches sediments. You should like this. Study. Catches the sediments. And, and uh, gradually, the land expands. So what was originally three islands became one island, Eiderstedt through this kind of process. And they created dikes that way. And this uh, was very um, uh, different from the kind of dikes you're thinking of because they were very low and very shallow. But it still required a lot of administration on the part of the people getting together to discuss their things. How do you do this? So there's an intimate re relationship then between this kind of organization, which is found all over Europe in various names. but and the um, and the way the landscape gets shaped, and then what we study when we think we're studying the land, well, we're also studying the product of a of a sociocultural system, a, a community actually. And what is interesting about this particular way of doing it is that the uh, the um, the land is the, the dikes are very very sh low, so. In a situation where there's a storm that drives the water up very hard, they will get uh, flooded. And so instead of, so what they did was they built their farms on mounds. Another thing which ought to make Tim happy, they're built on mounds. And uh, they have farmhouses. And uh, they have a characteristic very high roof, steep roof, thatched roof uh, because of the rain there. But also it's, uh, in the attic, they have these big doors that open out. 
and behind those doors in the attic is a boat. And that means that if the water gets too high, they get in the boat and row out. And, that, and when, I, when I was young and we were all hippies, it was called going with the flow. Uh, so, so that's the uh, idea there, is that the architecture and so on, which is very characteristic and very interesting, very much uh, reflects uh, the, the landscape, but not just the physical landscape, but the way it's organized. Also, I should say about these people was that um, they uh, only one person inherited the farm. The brother would get a boat, and they were they had basically invented sailing on in this area, uh, throughout this area. They were famous for transporting things from the farms and other places in the boats. So it was not a f a, 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 a farmer settlement that was bound to the soil. They were, but not only that, this grass was important because further north in Jutland, in Denmark, there was a lot of heather, and they grew a lot. They raised a lot of sheep and but particularly. Uh, cows and steers up there on the heather. Now, heather isn't that great in terms of food value. So they would raise them up there, and then they would drive them down uh, the, the a particular roadway through Jutland to this area, which is at the foot of Jutland, and fatten them up at Eiderstedt. And then they would be taken from Eiderstedt and places like that to the big cities like Hamburg and so on further south. So it's not about a f uh, an old-fashioned kind of frozen place. It was very inventive. They were inventing new modes of, of sailing. They were uh, tradesmen. They were farmers. Th but and also, one of the things most of you don't probably don't know about dikes and about the Netherlands and so on is the big problem is not really so much the sea, but the water that comes from the land. Because when you have a dike, you have to get the water out. And if there's too much water outside, if it's high water, then it's very hard to get the water out, and so you get flooded by fresh water. So they did not only have a land shop, which is the root of landscape, they had a water shop to regulate the use of water. And to do that, they also invented windmills to get the water, pump the water out. So this is not a very old-fashioned, dying society in the nostalgic. They're inventing new stuff to do these things, but they're doing it as a group. And they have to maintain these dikes also as a group. You can't just uh, have one person fix his dike and let the other one go, because th then you have a problem. So uh, so that was sort of trying to clarify. And, and so it's customs, how they do it, but how they evolve how we do these things. How you organize things. And things are not objects so much as they're things that have been transformed through this process. Uh, now, uh, you probably can't read this, but it says that uh, there are two kinds of pol political justice. The natural, this is from Aristotle, you've heard of him. There are two kinds of politic political justice, the natural and the conventional or customary. Natural justice has the same force everywhere and it does not depend upon its being agreed upon or not. Conventional customary justice is justice whose provisions are originally indifferent, but once these have been established, they are important, so they evolve through time. And uh, Taylor, using the to talk about the Greek notions of nomos and physis, phys uh, it, it usage renders nomos from the verb nomosin to have a usage or custom. Nomos is ho nomitsi, which has which is customary or enshrined in usage. So it's how you use things. The term is standardly contrasted with physis, literally nature, which in this general contrast is similar, similar, simply the abstract noun for how things are independent of human thought or belief. A related sense of nomos is norm, or more specifically law, derived from the basic sense of via the normity of custom and usage. And also there's a morality in it, like with the dikes. It's, you have a moral obligation to fix your dike or else you know, everybody will go down the drain. So natural law kind of is seen to come from the, the sky, from these ir irregular movements of uh, perfect what they thought were perfectly shaped heavenly bodies. And it was an inspiration for Euclidean geography, whereas uh, the thing uh, as a way of, of creating or generating custom and regulating it comes from the use of the land, of what we now call the land. Now, uh, these words nature is, is confusing because we're using it now in a way that you probably do not use it. 
So I'll give you a quote from an architect. We, just, we have five architects here. Uh, so the meaning of natural law as used in opposition to conventional or customary law can be illustrated by the application of the distinction as drawn by Sir Christopher Wren, who lived around s the mid-1600s, in respect to the aesthetics of architecture. He says, there are two causes of beauty, natural and customary. Natural is from geometry, consisting in uniformity, that is, equality, and proportion. Customary beauty is begotten by the use of the four senses to those objects which are usually pleasing to us for other causes, causes as familiarity or particular inclination breeds a love to things not in themselves lovely. So the lovely land nature is the geomet geometrically nature. So he says, finally, geometrical figures are naturally more beautiful than any other irregular in this all consent as to a law of nature. But do you consent to that? Probably not. But that was what they thought then, and that's what they're getting out of Aristotle. Now, uh, also here, uh, the Euclidean geometry. What is the problem with Euclidean geometry? Um, and why is it striated? Now, uh, definition one by Euclid is a point is that which has no part. That which has no part indicates that Euclid will be treating a point as having no width, length, or breadth, but as an individual, indivisible location, as on a map. Place is often defined as location, which is nonsensical. This makes no sense to call place location, because how can something be within a place if it is defined by Euclid? That is, the point on a map in Euclid has no dimensions whatsoever. So you can't put anything inside it. The same is the truth of a line. A line is breathless l length. So if you make a map, uh, a typical modern map with these lines, how many lines do you think you can put on a, on a, on a map? Infinite number because there's always, they're infinitely sm thin, so there's always a space between them. And no matter how many you put in, there will always be a space. So you never have a smooth transition. It's always more like a CD, a record, a digital record, which if you, you may not notice it with the ear, but it's the music is going like that. Not a glissando is not like that, but it's going up steps. And so uh, the problem then with Euclidean geometry and with the Euclidean map is it, it reduces places to locations which inherently don't exist. And the space between these that is enclosed is uh, absolute and uniform. And of course, if you look around you, nothing is absolute and uniform, except what modern architects may want to try to create. But it's not like that. Um, uh, now, uh, so definition two is a picture representing an extent of space with the various objects in it. And uh, uh, this illustration from Alice in Wonderland, I think, shows that very well. We have. Uh, and there's also, I have a painting by René Magritte, uh, or two paintings by him. And one of them shows a city that looks a lot like maybe Paris or something, where um, what he shows in this, if you can't see it, is uh, it's called Where Euclid Walked. And it's showing a boulevard going down a street like in Paris after a houseman got a hold of it. Par he destroyed a lot of Paris and made these straight boulevards so that they could shoot cannons balls down the basically down the boulevard. But basically, uh, the, the uh, artists made these drawings using Euclidean geometry, and then they get rep uh, rep uh, replicated, and people start building that way. I'll get more into that later. So uh, I have a picture here of the Pnyx in, is that pronounced correct? Yes. In Athens, yes. Uh, which around 500 is where Cleisthenes uh, he established a kind of representational democracy, or a, a kind of democracy not unlike what we saw in uh, in uh, Eiderstedt. But on across from here, across the valley, you can see the uh, Acropolis, and uh, the Acropolis was a kind of closed place controlled by priests. Not everyone could go there, whereas the Pnyx is a popular place. It's like a, a, a pasture uh, where. Um, where people could go and discuss things. And so 
I wanted to bring this way of talking down to where we're sitting. Um, landscape one, as, as defined, is I think is archipelagic, basically, uh, based on notion of the commons. So that uh, in the in Eiderstedt, for example, the commons was very much the water of the uh, of the uh, sea of the which they had shellfish and things and very rich. Uh, but on land, it would be common land, grazing land usually, that people would share and which bound the peoples together. And it was substantive and it had to do with touchable things. It was not insubstantial like Euclidean space. And it's again like Cora, I think. And uh, landscape two is continental, hegemonic, imperial, gridded landscape of homogenous absolute space. So the Romans really loved squares. They loved to put things into linear linear uh, roads that ignored everything about the topography just to go straight. Whereas uh, an archipelago is you have this shared sea that you uh, uh, must divide between you and which has different resources in different places. Uh, now, um, so the word rule as in ruler, a person who rules, a, a monarch, it comes from the Latin regular, straight, edge, rule, which comes from regia, to lead, straight, guide, ruler, region. So these words come all the way, all come from this idea of the straight line, uh, uh, and uh, very much part of how Ptolemy, for example, drew his maps. So that's one kind of map on the, on the, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I have a Portolan map, which shows how people related to each other uh, spatially in this kind of area, in the archipelago. And this is the archipelago. This is the archetypal pelago that we're in right now. And, and, and that you can, one could describe it without a map. Uh, I discovered this myself when working with a fisherman in the West Indies. Uh, it was also a volcanic island, interestingly enough, and it had a rather flat, uh, like here, it had outside the volcano, it was rather flat, and the sea was rather flat going out. But it got deep, deeper pretty fast. And the fishermen had fish traps that they would put out uh, to catch the fish, obviously, and, and they would sink them into the water. But they didn't have a buoy or a buoy on the top to hold the rope up. It, the rope was so short that the boy was under the water, so you couldn't see it. And that way they could assure that the other fishermen could not find their trap. But how did they find the trap? It's basically the way you would navigate here. What they would do is they would line up, say, a, uh, a mountaintop here, a special kind of saddleback mountain in this case, and a, an old water mill, uh, windmill here. And when the two line up here like that, and the from the other side, you have a lining up with a, a church, say, and a some tree on the coast. When they both line up, then you know where you are. And you can navigate in where you can see bodies of land all the time. You can navigate this way. And so it's your body moving through a real area relating to bodies of land and other bodies, as opposed to what we normally think of, those of us who grew up on the Atlantic Ocean, we think of these people going out in the sea with their looking at the stars and navigating according to the sky. Here you navigate according to the movement. And of course, the winds and all that are very important because you had something called dead reckoning. So you would know where the wind patterns of winds are, what the patterns of waves are, uh, and so on. So you could figure out where you are by looking at the water, the motion, and so on. And this Portolan chart is just a, a fancy way of drawing a map that enables you to locate yourself in relation to other bodies of land. This happens to be from where we are. And uh, the, uh, the word region, as, as used uh, by Johnson, I think fits very well Pelagos, uh, a sea, as used here. This different seas, we talk about different seas, they are like regions. And if you look at the way uh, uh, ancient Greece was established, uh, it, it was natural that Delos should be in the center of this because all the other places are around it. And, and uh, so that's, but um, now this is probably hard for you, very hard for you to see, but it's a, a map of Northern Europe using these same uh, techniques that, that Portolan is from 1539. But what it has is also a uh, uh, part of it is, is uh, Eastern Finland. And Eastern Finland used to be an archipelago 
of islands. But the land there is rising because when the glaciers melted, uh, the, the weight was removed and the land just kept going up and up. And so uh, the land, the what used to be islands then became part of the mainland, but there's still a huge amount of water around them. So you can still travel through this whole area on boats. So it's very much the same. It's just uh, a land bound. Um, now, um, one of the points I'd like to make about this is that if you think about a circle uh, using uh, geometry, you, uh, you, you, describe, you find many descriptions of uh, God. Uh, you have two pictures here. Uh, one, of a, one is a Greek Orthodox God who is creating the earth with a compass, making a circle, drawing around like, like architects do and so on. Uh, and that's how the, y the world is created. That is by drawing a, s a line around it and then putting something in it. But I believe that in a, a place like the Cyclades, Cyclades the, the, uh, the whole roundness of it is very important. But it's more like if you have a raindrop or a drop of water landing on a, a water, it sends out rings from the center. And I think the Cora in uh, the concept of Cora, uh, you apply it both to the towns here, the, the main town, but it then it's sort of the power that emanates from around the Cora. The Cora is the center, as was the thing in the in uh, in northern Europe. And also, then you can have other smaller Cora around it. So you have at the center you have uh, Vilos. And then around it, you have other islands with their centers, but they are subordinate to the larger one. And so I think this is the way of thinking of Cora. Cora also means a region in Greek. You all, but, and, but anyway, the, the uh, uh, idea then is it's a core that emanates from the core, not from somebody drawing a line around it. And of course, the problem with, or the uh, property and what defining things is this is my property. All this area of uniform space is mine, and I'll do what I want with it. It's not the way it works when you're thinking from the center out, but when you define everything within as an abstract uniform space. And it's the same problem with, with uh, the nation. They first in started using these maps, and then they decided to mark demarcate nations with hard lines around them. It used to be nations faded into each other, or countries faded into each other. But then they had a hard line between them. And, and this uh, meant that everything within these space, this Euclidean space, should be uniform and, ab uh, and absolute, so that everybody in Greek space should be Greek and talk Greek, and everybody in Turkish space should talk Turkish. And, and that created, uh, just here, a horrible situation, and, and it did all over the world, that having creating this uniformity. Um, and so I think this helps explain the, the importance of circularity also with the theaters and, and so on and so on. Uh, I wanted to get a bit into the uh, notion of landscape from below. Uh, we have a home in uh, Ermopoli on Syros. And from our home, basically, we can see uh, on the equinox, we can see uh, Apollo rise up from the land of uh, yeah, so Thelos. So he actually comes up from the land from where we sit and then goes up into the sky and goes around. Uh, and, and maybe goes down when they're watching it from here from, from Santorini. That's maybe why they clap when the sun goes down. I don't know. But uh, there is something about coming from below. And uh, I think it's interesting that the core of uh, Vilos was a sanctuary, a site of pilgrimage, which I think is a form of tourism, personally. And uh, religious and ethnic multiplicity, it's a neutral ground. Center of trade, importance for craftsmen. It was a free port, and it was cosmopolitan. It, it had to be peaceful, uh, ethnically, and religious coexistence. So it's a place of safety. And I think it's really curious how, when you live in the center of an archipelago like this, you have the commons has to be. You have a kind of moral obligation not to misuse the commons, or else it won't work. It's also the same with sheep raising. That you, if your neighbor just steals your sheep, then you can't have a commons. You, you know. Anyway, uh, so for Darada, Cora, uh, which is also spelled Koras, plays a role at the very foundations of the concept of place and placing, and thereby landscape. It signifies at its most literal level notions of site, region, land, and country. 
Finally, as Derrida also tells us, it has implication for the discourse on places, notably political places. And according to Derrida, Kor is a kind of hybrid being, a playful phenomena that cannot be represented, for example, using the space of a map. For him, the ordered polysemy, many meanings, of the word Kor always includes the sense of political place, or more generally, of invested place, by opposition to abstract space. Kora means place occupied by someone, country, inhabited place, territory, or region, Bei. Chorus is a political landscape. So this gets back to what I was saying. We can't just talk about the landscape as a, a bunch of rocks or whatever. You have to think about it in connection with the way people have been using it and shaping it. Uh, the emergence of rational thought, according to Jean-Pierre Vern Vernant, is closely linked to the advent of the open-air, unenclosed politics that characterized Aguirre's agitation in the Greek polis. Bernant, and I'm showing the Pninks again here, Bernant points out that when the focus of society changed from the enclosed space of the Acropolis to the common space of the Agora or Pninks, the change had profound social and cultural implications. Social experience could become the object of pragmatic thought for Greeks, he writes, because in the city-state, it lent itself to public debate. The decline of myth dates from the day the first sages brought human order under discussion and sought to define it. So discussing things this way uh, gets rid of the control of myths and religion and allows people to act rationally according to both social but also the physical constraints. Now just to bring in some architecture here uh, for your ha enjoyment, uh, Dimitris Picionis uh, captured, I think, the genius loci and the playing nature of Cora in his landscape work using the fragments of what was left of Athens' destruction under the predatory regime uh, reign of the military junta to create a pastoral landscape with a chapel and pave the walkways on Philopapos Hill, where the Pink Pinks is located, in an archipelagic rather than a geometric way. So what you see in these, paint in these pictures, if you can see them, is fragments of what was destroyed in Athens when they tore down lots of the neoclassical buildings and so on to build concrete structures. He reused them to make pathways, of all things, to uh, and a church. And, and, and I think it has a kind of archaeologic character because it's kind of squeezing different things in. Uh, now, the core of Cora, the plaza, platea, of the agora was an important political and economic meeting place. The word agora suggests the pastoral common origin, uh, coming from Latin gregarius or relating to a herd or flock, greg, grex, herd, Greek, agir, and to collect agora. So you assemble the people as a kind of flock, uh, as an assemblage, right, Tim? And, and, uh, and the agora, but then it becomes a place where people assemble. And um, they also had at this place uh, plays, and music were often played. So this one, um, this gathering place, is has a theater as well. So nomos uh, defined uh, it comes from that which is in habitual practice, use or possession. So it's a customary kind of thing. Usage, custom, hence law, ordinance. But it also is a melody or strain. And we're going to hear about melodies uh, tomorrow, I think. So. <coughs> how the law is related also to these ways of playing music. So the nouns nomos uh, both derive from the verb niwo, nimo, to dispense or to allot, with nomos being the result of allotment and nomos being the manner of allotment or dispensing justice. And it comes back again to herdsmen, pasture, grazing a flock, drive to pasture. So I'm just trying to bring in the, this element of the commons where you have sheep grazing into this. And uh, Foucault says, the shepherd's power is not exercised over a territory, but by, a definition, but by definition over a flock, and more exactly over the flock in its movement from one common place to another. So in contrast with the power exercised on the unity of a territory, pastoral power is exercised on the m of a multiplicity on the moves. First, the etymolo etymology traditionally accepted by the Pythagoreans derived Gnomus, the law, from gnomius, that is to say, the shepherd. Uh, and of course, uh, just an aside, but it's interesting if you 
happen to wander into a church, you will see shepherds all over the place and symbols of shepherds. Uh, this isn't accidental. It was very important at the time. Uh, and the flock is, uh, this is an example from the Lake District. Uh, the flock is divided several times a year in order to determine, for example, which lambs are fit to pasture the undivided upland commons and those which needed to be ha pastured for a while on the lowland undivided common meadowland. The flock is divided for pasturing. The land is not divided. The flock is divided. And in this area, when a farmer retires, he keeps, he doesn't own the land. He, he or she, he or she owns th the flock. And the flock, well, I'll get to that, is uh, particularly in the Lake District and the Scottish borderlands, the sheep are said to heft on or bond themselves to various islands of pasture scattered in the land like an archipelago. The sheep become attached to particular grazing places through familiarity, and the shepherd can therefore expect the sheep to follow particular cyclical patterns of movement in the course of the seasons. By extension, it also becomes the shepherd's heft, and the term shepherds used to describe their own feelings of belonging. So it's the sheep that heft, the shepherd then has the sheep, and then the, the shepherd feels that I heft, but it starts with the sheep, not with the shepherd. And heft comes from the Old Norse hivde, which means to have and to keep up, as with the holding of an old custom, but also in the sense of maintenance, by which one both, uh, which one both maintains a path through walking or a pasture through use, and not abuse, and one maintains the right to do so. So the maintenance of such a use is in turn connected to the meaning of hift as a prescriptive customary use right based on precedence. Pastures turn into scrub if they are not used, and this means that your right to pasture disappears with the pasture. So the point is then, you must graze a pasture or it turns into something else, bush and whatnot. So you lose the right to it if you don't use it. And it's the same with the path. I know you've been interested in path. You, keep, you have to use a path in order to keep the grass from growing, from bushes to grow, in order to continue using it. So you get a kind of hefted right to it. And this is still the term we use in Scandinavia. Uh, but they still use the same Scandinavian term in the Lake District because they were settled by Scandinavians and the sheep came from Scandinavia. So the idea then is that um, it's not property. It's this kind of area that sh sheep uh, settle on. And the sheep don't care about boundaries that much. So if you have a, a bad storm and it's only safe to be on one side of the river rather than the other, you can see the red sheep are merging with the blue sheep in this picture, which is taken in very bad weather, I'll have you know. I had a waterproof camera with me. So they don't mind this, but they're a little like a magnetic field that you know, use the wrong side of the mirror that they push apart. As soon as they uh, are allowed to, they they'll move apart again because the different flocks are separate and belong to different shepherds and so on. It is the mistake to dichotomize between nomadic shepherding and farming in fixed locations. Until relatively recently, the arable production from fields was dependent upon fertilizing manure from grazing animals. The grazing animals were fed in winter on hay from valley, common meadows, and in summer by grazing on the upland pasture commons. Reaching and returning to this pasture could involve considerable movement, transhumance. This movement also demanded common customary rights of way and pasturage along the way. And uh, the, the they still use the Scandinavian word there for these wa rights away, a, a sheep gang, gang being Danish. So anyway, I don't want to go into too much detail here, and this is just my guess. But uh, ancient Athens was divided into demis, dems, demis, themis. Of course, the D is always soft. Themis. They were not continuous, contiguous, and this map shows how complicated it was. But basically, the uh, each of the colors on the map uh, distinguish how they divided it up so that the division of the Athenian city-state polis into urban pink, inland green, and coastal blue zones by Cleisthenes, uh, I think, has something to do with the importance of sheep at that time. You had to have lowland areas in certain seasons and highland areas in other seasons to graze them back and forth to take advantage of the grazing changes, but also the insects and other things that bu bu bug the animals uh, at certain seasons. So I just wanted to show how sheep really matter. 
Uh, now, the heritage of commons landscape can be described also in terms of Ingold's meshwork of paths and lines made by humans and animals in their movements. Also in cities, I would add, and archipelagically in water. It is the summation of lines and places that make a landscape our own. So I would say that you have a similar meshwork here in the Cyclades as you would, uh, as, as Tim is more describing in relation to dry land. Oh, and also, for Tim's benefit, I have some reindeer, which I know you love reindeer. Uh, yes. Now, there is a certain resemblance between the ideas of Mich Michel de Soto concerning the way the landscape of place is created, where people heft much the way sheep and shepherds do, walking their pastures or archipelago dwellers sailing their waters. In, the dis in de Soto's analysis, the rational laws projected upon the landscape by the univocal scientific strategies of the Hobbesian state are counterpoised to the anonymous law of the pedestrian, meaning both the commonplace and the movement by foot or sailing an archipelago. Walking for de Soto is a particular example of the more general context, concept of practice by which the community is woven together with a complex archipelago of places. It is through a transgressive practice that, for example, a crossroads or town square can be transformed from an anonymous location to a place with a history of meaning woven with passages of meaning, meaning both a written passage and a place of passage. So then the idea then is that walking and moving these, this, uh, these lines uh, through the, an open landscape, which is not striated and propertized and absolute and uniform, but which is smooth. You can move through it. Nothing smoother than water. Uh, and I should point out that um, the commons is a shared interest or value. It is the patrimony or legacy of a community and refers to anything that contributes to the material and social sustenance of a place with a shared identity, land, buildings, seed stock, knowledge of practices, a transportation network, and an educational system or rituals. Now I should say with regard to this older sense of landscape, number one, is that it's not out of date because the, the uh, recently the Landscape Convention of 2000 was uh, signed and ratified by most countries of Europe and it defines landscape not as scenery but as an area as perceived by people whose character is the result of the action and interaction of natural and or human factors. So uh, landscape is the place of the people and we should recognize landscape and law as an essential component of people's surroundings, an expression of the diversity of their shared cultural and natural heritage and a foundation of their identity. So uh, this meaning is not uh, so out of date as some would argue. I think I'm gonna go a little faster here. In the ancient Greece, the hefted foundation of people's customary historical uh, heritage was found via the theater and the mask as performed at a, at a common place. Hillis Miller notes that prosopopoeia personification initially meant the ascription of a voice or a face to the absent, the inanimate, or the dead. Ancient Greek theater used the mask in order to create prosopopoeia, not simply as a rhetorical device, but as a means which, by which living actors could express the heritage of a polity. As David Wiles points out, in the age of Sophocles, donning a face, i.e. a mask, was no negative act of concealment, but a positive act of becoming. So you, you, the, you rise up the, an, the uh, ancestors and the customs and so on from the dead when you can put on a mask, you can do that. And actually that's literally what happened on the, on the stage. So you can see that um, maybe, and Paphos, there's a theater where you can, on the left, you can maybe see that there's a hole in the ground, that actors actually could come up from under the ground uh, uh, and surface. And they would do this at the very center of the uh, stage, which was where the gnomon was located. The gnomon was like a sundial, and you could always see the shadow and know what time it was. Like maybe you're looking at your shadow now and thinking, when is he going to stop? What time is it? We, you know, you don't need a watch. So, uh, so uh, according to Michel Ciri's, the word gnomon represents itself is reflected in the face of a sundial. The world represents itself is reflected in the face of a sundial, and we take part in this event, not more, no less than a post, which is the sun, the 
that makes the shade, i.e. the gnomon of a sundial. For standing upright, we also cast shadows, or as seated scribes, stylus in hand, we too leave lines. I just wanted to say that I, I'm going to try to cut this short, but um, the word gnomon means knowledge. You might notice that in English we spell it K-N-O. It comes from that. Uh, series continues. Modernity begins when this real world space is taken as a scene, that is a stage scene, controlled by a director, and it's turned inside out like the finger of a glove or a simple optical diagram, and plunges into the utopia of a knowing inner intimate subject. The black hole absorbs the world. But before this absorption, the world as such remains the seat of knowing, gnomon. So it's when we change from this kind of theater where we're all in the space looking at each other to the kind of theory theater where we have an abstract uh, linear landscape background as defining it. And this starts in the Renaissance. And so the first modern use of the word landscape to mean scenery comes from the stage, not from painting. And uh, it was in the Mask of Blackness where they say first for the scene was drawn a land shop. S okay, that's 1605. And during the Renaissance, with the rise of the central state, trade, and an increasingly global money economy, governments and wealthy individuals began to enclose and alienate common lands regulated by land use, transforming them into territorial states and states governed by property rights. The rediscovered Ptolemaic map not only facilitated the division of the land into regular measurable properties, its underlying grid was experienced as representing an underlying and abstract emblematic and ideal. Platonic ideal. Place was reduced to the location in a global Euclidean space. And uh, the next one shows how artists use this map by tilting the, tilting the projection to create perspectival representations. And you can do this on your, on your computers using Google, uh, uh, Google Earth by, you can tilt it. And then you, it, so it's, what you're seeing looks like it's depth, but in reality it's just an illusion created by the, the, the uh, perspective of the map. I don't know if you can see these pictures, but they give you a good idea of how this was done. So modern landscape is built by changing from this older idea of landscape to this idea of landscape derived from the Ptolemaic map and from tilting it to create a near perspective. There are other ways of creating perspective, but this is the dominant one. So in the, I'm going to, so following Joan's inspiration, landscape becomes a scenic Arcadian stage for the emblematic performance of power. They created these landscape gardens around estates where people could perform as if they were living, as if they were shepherds living in ancient Arcadia. Uh, and the idea was that uh, the um, Arcadian historian Polybius said that in Arcadia that you had a similar system to that I described for, uh, for the Wadden Sea. That is that people would be meeting, they would have uh, various kinds of, uh, of uh, rituals and so on like that, which would be the basis of forming a kind of community. And then they were saying that we are shepherds like this. But nowadays, shepherds are a fallen lot. They're not really any good anymore. We, the nobility or the rich people, are the real shepherds. And so they made these uh, Greek, phony Greek uh, castles and things too. And it was called a Palladian uh, landscape because Palladio was the first to do this. In uh, America, the whole country, well, the western part of the country was divided into squares like this. The whole country. Uh, colonial power, um, and as this illustrates from, from Magritte, you can see how this way of thinking, of representation, then becomes a way of creating boulevards and so on. And Le Corbusier grew a lot of uh, inspiration from this, and so he, he's creating a landscape which can be seen from picture windows, uh, perspectival, and so on. This, this particular uh, vision of a modern Paris was created on top of what was the Jewish, what still is, in fact, the Jewish ghetto. He was going to erase it and replace it with this wonderful uh, landscape. Um, now, can you stand anymore? Or should I stop here? I, it's too hot. It's hard to tell me to stop, isn't it? Yeah, it won't hurt my feelings. Uh, not very long.
Not very long. I just wanted to point out, I, hope, I don't know if you can see it, but what I have is a Christmas card on the left, which says, Welcome for Christmas in Vestibirubia, which is a village or a hamlet where we have a, a home, which you can see at the bottom. It's a thatched, half-timbered little cottage. It's from the 1700s. And on both sides of the, I have two arrows pointing to two trees. One is an ash tree, and the, and the other is an elm. And in Nordic mythology, the ash, which you can see below, was the Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil, was the cosmic ash. The whole universe was conceptualized as an ash with the roots below the ground, and the sky is the tree top. And uh, we were born of the, of the elm. The elm was the mother, the ash was the father. And these two trees are at the edge of our property, which was created before you had enclosure, before you had property. So these two are on the edge of not of a property, but of the use space of this cottage. So they were not put on a property line, but on a, on a kind of customary area. And, um, but today, um, things have been enclosed. The more and more city people are moving in. They don't respect custom. So we decided that we needed to have it surveyed and we had needed to have our land put on a map, because, particularly because most of the garden was belonged to the neighbor, not to us, even though it went right to our wall because of some mistake they made. So in order to get this surveyed, we, in order to make sure we kept our garden, we had to have it surveyed. And the surveyor came and he said, those two trees are wi very, very old, therefore, that line must go between them. Your property goes between those trees. So those trees, they're called guardian trees in Denmark. Guardian trees. And they really did guard us from evil spirits because they, they were basis for the, uh, the, the surveyor. Also, next to it, well I have a, a picture of a roadway, or of, uh, a way, a private way, uh, but we have a customary right to it. But it was originally it was uh, originally everybody respected that kind of thing, but the land was bought up by a merchant from the city who wanted to have a kind of estate there, a pretend estate. And he didn't want anybody to go there, so there's a sign saying, closed private property right behind there. And, uh, but what happened was there was a, a man who was actually turned out to be a very prominent uh, jurist, a lawyer, who bought a house in the village, in the custom, in the, uh, our village, and he was walking there, and the guy who had bought this, the new owner, stopped him and said, you know, you're walking on my land. And the guy said, oh. And he said, yes, but if you give me uh, 10 kroner, I'll let you walk on it. And he said, no way. I'm not going to pay you because then I will accept your right to keep me from walking here. And I know that people have been walking here for hundreds of years. So I have a customary right to walk here. And so this guy, of course, took him to court and lost. So it's now we have a legal right to walk in these paths. And, and uh, so here's a similar way that uh, this customary right, uh, and uh, it's a map you can't read, but it shows anyway that there are quite a few footprints, uh, footpaths going through here. But there's also um, another path which is more rustic, which belonged to a nobleman that was also customarily saved from use by, uh, so that w ordinary people can use it because they have been using it for centuries. And also under the ground, you can see that uh, there was a stream there with meadows and the commons and so on, which has been drained today, so you don't see it. But um, one day the drains got blocked and a lake popped up right where there had been uh, dry land. So the whole idea then is that under the landscape, this older landscape is still there. And we our customary rights are rooted in it. And these are very old rights. So that's, uh, I was just going to say the same kind of rights applied to many urban parks, started off as commons. And I'll just close with this statement from uh, Tim Ingold. There is a particular logic that has a central place in the structure of modern thought. I call this the logic of inversion. What it does, in a nutshell, is to turn the pathways along which life is lived into boundaries with which, within which it is enclosed. Life, according to this logic, is reduced to an internal property of things that occupy the world but do not strictly inhabit it. 
a world that is occupied but not inhabited, that is filled with existing things rather than woven from the strands of their coming into being, is a world of space. And so we close here with um, our dog and my wife walking down the road. <laughs>